all know that the hypothalamic pituitary axis controls a large number of hormones across the body and it controls the various end organs. So we've got the GHRH, which basically controls uh, growth hormone acting on the liver, which produces IGF-1. There is a reciprocal effect of growth hormone suppressing the GHRH secretion, which happens in that direction. There is a suppression of growth hormone via, via the IGF-1 as well. Then we have the TRH, which basically controls the TSH, and this TRH will control the production of thyroxine from there. Very importantly, there is also a negative feedback from thyroxine on TSH as well as TSH on TRH. The third most important hypothalamic regulation which happens is at the level of dopamine, which basically inhibits prolactin production. So this is the only uh, anterior pituitary hormone which is actually suppressed by the hypothalamus. All other hormones are going to stimulate it. There's a tonic stimulation, but prolactin is one which is continuously suppressed. Therefore, if you have a child who presents to you with a pituitary deficiency, what is very important is to look at the prolactin level. If the prolactin level is low, it means that there is a damage which is happening at the level of the pituitary stalk or below. Lesions at the stalk and above will have a high prolactin. So prolactin is the most important differentiator with regards to the overall uh, aspect of pituitary etiology. We also have CRH, which is a 41 amino acid compound which controls the ACTH production, regulating cortisol production on one hand. And then this cortisol also inhibits the ACTH as well as CRH as a feedback inhibition. Now, what we also need to understand that there are other functions as well in the form of GNRH, which basically controls the LH, FSH, which together control the production of testosterone and estrogen, which again have a negative feedback. So LH is predominantly inhibited by a, in Riddhi, which hormones control the LH secretion? And which is the feedback hormone which controls the LH secretion? Testosterone in uh, boys and progesterone in girls. So progesterone will be inhibiting when FSH is basically regulated more in terms of the inhibin levels which is there. Then we've got the AVP axis which is basically controlling the urinary osmolality. So this is the entire hypothalamic pituitary axis which is basically controlling each and every aspect of development starting right from growth to temperature to lactation to stress response, blood pressure, and glucose, pubertal development, and osmolality. So in a way, this hypothalamic pituitary is controlling the entire spectrum of pediatric endocrinology. And if there are disorders anywhere, there could be multiple issues in that regards. Now, what we need to understand is that these are not just binary hormones. So it's not just that you have one hormone going into the other. There is also a crosstalk which is basically happening in that regards. And these crosstalks are also very, very important in terms of assessment in that regards. So dopamine is, while we consider dopamine to be an inhibitor of prolactin, also inhibits TSH. And this is very important in an intensive care setting. So if somebody is on dopamine, your TSH level will be low. And therefore, newborn infants who are sick may have a low level of TSH. And this does not mean that there is a central hypothyroidism. Similarly, if you have somebody who has got a primary hypothyroidism, congenital hypothyroidism, who has been on dopamine, may miss that and that will result in missing of congenital hypothyroidism. So sick neonates who are on dopamine have to have their thyroid functions done after three weeks. Very importantly, there is also a cross effect of TRH which basically stimulates prolactin. So any condition of primary hypothyroidism will result in a very high level of TSH, high level of TRH, and this will cause hyperprolactinemia. So before you work up, do an MRI, look at thyroid profile essentially, because that can cause a confusion in that regards. Now there is also an effect of prolactin, as Riddhi was talking about, on GNRS neurons, and what it does is that it will suppress the LH as well as the FSH level. Now, a very important feedback mechanism which happens is the AVP cortisol axis. Now, we all talk about the CRF ACTH cortisol axis. There is a link between AVP and cortisol. Now, these are two very, very important hormones. One, AVP is regulating the osmolality. 
Cortisol is playing a role in blood pressure. So they have to interact with each other. And this interaction basically happens at the level of the hypothalamus. So AVP along with CRF regulates the secretion of ACTH and cortisol on the other hand inhibits AVP. So if you have high amount of cortisol, your AVP will come down as well as there is a direct effect of cortisol on free water excretion. So if there is cortisol deficiency, the AVP level goes up, the free water excretion comes down and you have a picture like SIADH. So everybody who has SIADH, you have to exclude cortisol deficiency. On the other way around, if you have somebody who has got a underlying diabetes insipidus, let's say because of craniopharyngioma, if they develop uh, cortisol deficiency, what will happen for peak in that setting? So if somebody has DI and then you have developed a cortisol deficiency, what will happen? So there will be resolution of DI. So cortisol deficiency should be suspected in somebody who is known case of diabetes insipidus where the AVP requirement come down, a known case of type 1 diabetes where glucose requirements come down, a known case of hypoparathyroidism where the calcium requirements come down, a known case of hypertension where the blood pressure requirement comes down. So this is a very simple formula because cortisol is bad for calcium, it is bad for overall in terms of your fluid status, bad for sugar and bad for BP. So if your cortisol level goes down, your blood pressure, your sugar, your calcium and all those things are in a way inadvertently will rise and that's why there will be issues in that regards and that is something you have to be wary about by this crosstalk which is there. Now cortisol also suppresses TSH. So if you have cortisol deficiency, your TSH may go up. This rise will be like 10 to 15. You will have normal FT4 and TSH is 10 to 15. You will say, okay, this is subclinical hypothyroidism, but that's not the fact. It is basically representing a lack of inhibitory effect of cortisol. So what we are looking at is that in cortisol deficiency, if your TSH is slightly high, that does not mean that there is a actual subclinical hypothyroidism. Wait and watch once you have replaced hydrocortisone, it will improve. What will happen if somebody has Cushing syndrome to TSH with D? will come now. So if you have got very high cortisol, whether it is pharmacological or it is because of endogenous Cushing's, your TSH will come down. And this basically may give you a picture of central hypothyroidism. So this is not true also. So if you have very high cortisol, low TSH is part of the effect. So don't worry about that in that perspective. Now this cortisol will also have an effect on growth hormone. So if you have cortisol deficiency, your growth hormone levels will go up. If you have cortisol deficiency, your growth hormone may go up. Can you think of a condition in which cortisol deficiency, so does cortisol deficiency cause tall stature? Does any form of cortisol deficiency cause tall stature? Why? So theoretically, there is an inhibitory effect of cortisol on GHRH, GH, GH receptor and chondrocytes. So if your cortisol is low, you should grow more, you should become tall. But of course, if you don't have cortisol, you will have a lot of other problems as well. So generally, that is overcome by those chronic problems and that's why the growth is not more. But as you said, MC4 receptor is a different thing altogether. Familial low corticoid deficiency, MC2 receptor, the effect is associated with tall stature because the inhibitory effect of cortisol is not there in that regard. So this is something which is significant from that uh, perspective. The other thing to remember is that if you have got excess cortisol, your growth hormone may be low. So in somebody who has got Cushing syndrome, you will find the growth hormone level to be low. So you have to exclude two conditions before you do a growth hormone stimulation test. Exclude cortisol excess and exclude hypothyroidism. So this interaction, I think this slide is the most important slide to think of if you can really understand the, all the intricacies. 90% of pituitary evaluation will become very, very easy from that clinical perspective. Now, if we look at the now pathophysiology as to what happens with various disorders and when we should think of it, so when would you think of doing a pituitary function assessment, Pratik? In what conditions? 
Yeah. So if you find that somebody has a proven deficiency or there are clinical features of deficiency, clinical features of excess, what else? Where else will you do a pituitary function assessment? Single hormone deficiency. So that's it. So if you have a single deficiency, you'll of course look at other hormone deficiencies. If you if you find an incidental mass or some findings on an MRI, like uh, uh, interrupted uh, interrupted arch PSIS like syndrome, if you have got septo-optic dysplasia, you will do. Or if there is an insult, if there is a radiotherapy, if there is a trauma, if there is a surgery, you will evaluate. So if you talk about evaluation indications for pituitary functions, they will basically include a documented deficiency, clinical features of deficiency, documented excess, clinical features of excess, imaging abnormalities, which may be incidental, or if there is a definite uh, insult to pituitary, which will happen. So how do these manifest? We all know about that. If there is a growth hormone deficiency, you will have growth failure. With hypoglycemia being extremely unusual, but rarely in infancy, isolated GHD may also contribute to hypoglycemia. So that's a bit more like a ketotic hypoglycemia. So you don't have that much response. So if you're fasting more, you may develop hypoglycemia with GHD in that regards. Thyroid deficiency, we all know about hypothyroidism. And what is the type of hypothyroidism? So your T4 will be low and TSH will be less than 20. So if your TSH is less than 20 with a low T4, it basically means that we have central hypothyroidism. If you have lactation failure, that is basically the presentation in females, of course, not relevant in children. That is because of prolactin deficiency, typically in Sheehan syndrome. Cortisol deficiency is extremely difficult to identify. They will have subtle symptoms like lethargy, weakness, hyponatremia with a normal potassium. I think this is a major point which we talk about a lot of times because ACTH is a very minimal regulator of aldosterone synthesis. It does stimulate a release a bit, but long-term ACTH does not control aldosterone. The most important regulator of aldosterone is potassium. So potassium level and ang 2 These are the two. So angiotensin 2 and potassium. So that's why hyperkalemia does not happen if you have a central ACTH deficiency and therefore they will have milder features which are there in that regards. Of course, there will be features of hypoglycemia which will be ketotic. Hypogonadism can present with delayed puberty. It can present with stalled puberty. It can present with oligomenorrhea in girls. It can present with erectile dysfunction. So these manifestations are there at various points of time. Very importantly, congenitally, it may present with a micropenis-like picture as well. And of course, AVP will cause DI. And these are the manifestations that you see in terms of deficiency. Which one of these is the most common that you see? So of course, you're talking here or the gonadotropin deficiency. Now, most of these conditions may actually be isolated. So if you have DHD, it's unusual, unless you have a classical picture of the syndromic child, it, the GHD is usually isolated. JNRH deficiency is also isolated. So it doesn't mean that everybody whom you think that this is Kalaman syndrome, you start doing the entire pituitary function test. GHD, you have to do thyroid anyway before you work up. You have to do cortisol before you work up. You cannot do gonadotropin right now because they are usually young when they are treated. So in this situation, you can get away without a complete pituitary function test. If you have somebody who has a normal height, somebody who is thriving well, somebody who doesn't have any of the symptoms, there is anosmia, height is 164 centimeters, there is good growth. So you think that, okay, this is looking like an isolated GNRH deficiency and Kalaman syndrome. I don't want to do other workups. So this is something that you can exclude. But if you have, and which one of these will be the most likely, less likely to be isolated among all of them? Uh, prolactin deficiency, we will not be looking at. So prolactin is usually, the, because as I said, there are no manifestations in children. The only manifestation would be lactation failure in adults. So prolactin is something which you will not be looking at. So one thing which will usually never happen isolated is, ACTH because body wants to protect ACTH. How does it protect ACTH? Those uh, ACTH secreting cells are located in the center of the pituitary. 
they get a lot of collateral blood flow. So if there is a vascular insult, your ACTH secreting cells will be the last to be taken. The ACTH cells are most radio resistant. So if there is a radiotherapy, the ACTH cells will go the last in that situation. The ACTH is controlled by multiple genes. PROP1 has only got a sort of a supporting role. It is controlled by neuro D3, via TPID. So it's unlikely that you have an isolated ACTH deficiency. The very rare situation in which ACTH is vulnerable is a autoimmune damage in adults. In children, autoimmune hypophysitis mainly causes DI, GHD, gonadotropin deficiency. While in older individuals, it has a tendency of having a TPID antibody or TBX10 antibody, which basically causes ACTH deficiency. So if you have a child whom you're diagnosing as an isolated central hypopartidolism or ACTH deficiency, you have to think 10 times before you do that because it is extremely unusual. You will have multiple other hormones which are evaluated. So you have to evaluate for all other causes. Now, coming on to the other one, the TSH. Do you think that isolated TSH is common? It's also very unusual. So the only problem which can cause isolated TSH abnormalities will be TSH beta defect or a TRH receptor defect. They are very, very unusual. So as a rule, if you have one pituitary deficiency, you have to evaluate for all other. Very importantly, if it's just GNRH, you can exclude. What about DI? If you have DI, do you need to evaluate for other manifestations as well? Is DI associated with anterior dysfunction? Yes, no? Yes, because a lot of them have a stock lesion. So if you have a stock lesion, it can cause. If it is histiocytosis, you can have GHD. If there's a tumor, it can also cause GHD. If it's hypophysitis, a lot of them also have growth hormone abnormalities. So if you have DI, you have to do the entire workup. So the general message is that if there is deficiency, you have to work up for all the other manifestations.